Atkinson. I am. I run our product team, which at DZone, and which encompasses our content in our community. Um, and uh, for those of you who are here that may, or who are watching this at some point, um, don't know what DZone is. DZone is a a rather large online community for working software professionals to share their experience to learn new technologies and to grow professionally. Um, all of the content that you read on DZone comes from people practicing in the software industry. Um, and, you know, that's that leads us to our, pa our panel here today. We really, um, our goal is to help Whoever's uh, working in the software or you kind of make great decisions. I've got a, a little echo here. Um, make great technical decisions, make decisions, you know, in their technical career by learning from people who are actually solving the same types of problems. So um, today's panel, we are going to focus on containers um, and probably more broadly cloud native discussions around cloud native. Um, and our hope today is that we're going to hear from people who are really working on the front lines of using these technologies. Um, and so today we have uh, three people on the panel. We have Dr. Magesh Kashthuri, who is a senior member and a distinguished member of, of technical staff at WePro. We have Boris Zykin, who is a so, uh, software and cloud architect at NordCloud. And we have AJ Kantz, who's a DevOps lead at Cognizant. Um, so I will let you guys, I would like for each of you to kind of introduce yourselves and just kind of tell us um, your interest in container technologies and cloud native, your experience and, and you know, uh, and, and why you're here today and what, what, what you like to talk about. So. I'll start with uh, Dr. Magesh. Um, please okay. introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, uh, Khaled. Yeah, so myself, uh, Dr. Magesh, uh, a distinguished member in Vipro, and uh, I did my PhD in deep learning and uh, genetic algorithms. Basically, I work with Vipro for uh, cloud transformation practice in which uh, I'm handling banking, financial services, insurance, and uh, securities capital markets customer. Uh, basically, I work with these customers for cloud migration and cloud transformation related activities. And uh, with my interest and uh, area of work on uh, containerization, uh, I basically work with uh, customers where they want to have this portability of uh, cloud migration, particularly um, uh, to, to have this uh, re-host or refactor kind of uh, options where they don't want to really uh, spend high efforts in uh, migrating application by re-architecting the application, but rather do um, lift and shift or containerizing it and then uh, migrating it to the cloud. And uh, basically, I work with customers for uh, Azure, AWS, and GCP for uh, containerization, microservices development, monolithic to microservices conversion, and also on uh, um, uh, cloud agnostic solutions for multi-cloud uh, uh, related aspects. So this is my background and uh, experience with the containers and the cloud related activities. Back to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and now we can move uh, on, on to Boris. Uh, yeah. Boris, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your experience. Boris, in this uh, sorry. Uh, okay, I can hear now. Okay, so my name is Boris Zaiken. I'm the cloud and software architect uh, at NorCloud uh, and IBM company. So uh, my area of interest is in, is in building the complex uh, software and cloud uh, solutions that solves like uh, area and helps in areas like aerospace, uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, accounting and uh, 
accounting and uh, high load system. So basically, my interest in uh, containerization uh, application is that uh, currently we have a lot of uh, project that on uh, ongoing and that based on uh, containers. So here I can uh, explain in detail where this containers is a is a good practice, where is a bad, and where maybe it's it's a not a good idea to use them. Where it was an awesome uh, option to move to the containers. So basically, that's it <laughs> on my side. Awesome, thank you, Boris. Um, and so finally, we'll go to AJ. So AJ, please introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, hi, uh, th thanks, Khaled. Uh, my name is Ajay Kanse. Uh, I'm working with uh, Cognizant currently, Cognizant Technology Solutions. Um, working in IT for about uh, 20 years now, I started with uh, uh, as a developer and then slowly moved to you know configuration management build release i also performed uh, project management roles technical project management roles and now uh, right now kind of landed into the devops architects uh, space you know i like this particular field very much so i'm continuing with this particular field um, as far as um, containerization experience uh, in, in 2017 i, I started working on the Docker. I didn't know what exactly Docker was during that time. You know, I started with the POCs uh, for the customers and uh, my, my specialization is currently with the CI CD pipeline, you know, setting up the CI CD pipeline and working with developers. So that was, that was the first use case for us to use Docker and see how we can uh, implement containerization in our CI CD pipeline. That was one of the use cases that we started with uh, back in 2017. And since then, I continue to work in uh, containers, Docker. You know, I, I uh, was playing with various tools, uh, with Kubernetes, and now uh, uh, my team is currently implementing uh, OpenShift at the strategic level for the customers. So, you know, a lot of work with the customers I'm doing currently, uh, working with a lot of users uh, to help them out to onboard their applications, uh, defining the strategies, and so on and so forth. It's a lot of interesting stuff. Awesome, thank you, AJ. So having heard each of you introduce yourselves, you're all working with a bunch of uh, customers to kind of help them in their, their cloud migrations. Um, can, what, what kinds of things are leading companies to consider using containers right now from your perspective? Well, I think now it's, mm -hmm. A lot of companies just uh, following this hype with a containerization plus uh, Kubernetes and uh, moving to the containers. So that's uh, sometimes it's good, uh, sometimes it's bad. Maybe you can even see this uh, the huge track and with a small car on it and it said this this is our a small home page one page a website it's deployed uh, to the kubernetes so yeah it's basically what i would like to talk is a uh, keep it simple principle so uh only uh the, those companies uh like for example netflix they have a huge uh a, a lot of uh, i would say infra and micro services and this is the good idea where you should consider to use the containers, where you can scale up, scale down, and so on. So this is it. But uh, not when you when it comes to your uh, small micro side, then it's maybe not a good idea. Or just uh, deploy it as, as simple as possible. I, I, I would say. That makes yeah, sense. Also. So, so when, um, how about uh, Dr. Magash or AJ? When you have uh, when you have customers that come to you and they want to do to containerize their applications, what what are the types of things that are leading them there? So, obviously, I think Boris mentioned 
maybe there's some hype involved and they just want to be involved in the technology or using a technology because everyone is, but are there, are there legitimate things that bring people, companies to the table um, to consider containerizing their applications? Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, from my, my perspective, what I, my observation is uh, last few years, right? Cloud started, started to pick it up, right? Everyone wanted to be cloud native. You know, uh, the main strategy is how do you migrate your infrastructure to cloud? And um, as we started seeing that there is a rise in the containerization, uh, what what my personal feeling and what my observation is that, you know, containerization is kind of helping, going to help customers or helping customers to, um, to uh, uh, with, with their journey to the cloud, because, uh, you know, for most of the companies, the strategy is currently like multi-cloud, right? No one wants to stick to the single cloud. So, you know, you'll see in most of the places that companies will have multi-cloud strategies. Now, when, when you say that, you know, it's multi-cloud strategy, still you have to manage multiple uh, cloud providers. Now, why containerization comes into picture and why, you know, everyone wants to do container, containerize their applications is basically, that is going to help them out to move to multiple clouds. You know, you have one single platform on all the clouds and it is kind of a same platform and then you will be able to migrate the applications in the same, in the same way with the containerization. I think that is giving more value for all the you know, customers or organizations. And that is why along with the cloud, you'll always see that it's like, you know, containerization is in the picture. So one of the main benefits then you're seeing is that people can can operate in a multi-cloud environment uh, with, with containers, and that's kind of a main motivator for moving that direction. Correct. I mean, there are other benefits as well, but you know, this is kind of enabling them for moving to clouds as well. Got it. I, I think that's the value that uh, is a scalability. So uh, when you have application uh, and, uh, and you put it in containers, so the best what you can do is uh, scale upscale down the application and this is uh, what actually the, uh, i think the main problems of containers that another problem which containers solve is the problem it works on my machine maybe you know yeah, yeah. that's all the developers always talk about However, I have one example where uh, migration of, of just a single API was like a, a, a disaster in, in, in our case. So we migrated our API with a, a Docker. Uh, of course, it was uh, migrated with uh, pipelines based on Azure DevOps pipelines. So um, we migrated our app uh, web API and uh, there was the problem of on Azure side when they so basically all uh, infrastructure in cloud is the virtual machine with the CPU and memories everybody knows this and uh, of course there are some disk on top and it was not that good implemented that containers all containers stored directly on the on this disk of the machine and uh, by the end when you deploy uh, when you do this like a thousand deployment it's everything is stored directly there and it was like out of space memory so this is, was a case when we have like a production issue when, when we, so then we have to contact the cloud uh, azure cloud uh, the support uh, to decide and do some some tricky stuff, uh, which is impossible to do with the cloud because you can't directly log into their in infrastructure because it's a, it's a SaaS. So that was the case. But if and, and if you not uh, if imagine this case where where we like uh, not doing this, we, we will store everything on the storage account. For example, then it, there is no problem at all with this. 
So that's kind of of my uh, one of my bad examples with uh, the. <laughs> so, what do you guys see in terms of um, the the kind of key hurdles that organizations have when they're starting this uh, this journey? So, um, as as organization starts thinking about you know containerization or the cloud, uh, one of the major thing comes into picture is you know how do you how how is how do these companies enable their uh, employees to understand these new technologies, right? So first of all, the folks have to understand all these new technologies and get them onboarded. Then uh, you know, they have to look into their current landscape of their applications and you know it is not that you'll be able to migrate uh, you know entire set of applications to cloud or you know you'll be able to containerize your applications all the applications or all footprints of applications into container uh, into containers and then migrate it to whatever the platform that you go ahead with there is a lot of work that have to be done behind the scene uh, from from the path perspective or from the roadmap roadmap perspective you know that includes upskilling upskilling the employees uh, who are going to work on those particular applications developers uh, i mean to say uh, in that uh, uh, apart from that setting up the infrastructure doing the poc with various tools like you know there are so many so many tools currently available in the market with respect to the uh, containers uh, and even for the clouds, you know, what services you are going to use and all that. So all that analysis is is kind of a big work that have to be done uh, ahead of time. Uh, what my observation is that, you know, companies typically start slow, just to understand, at least that's my, my personal experience, you know, where I'm working currently. You start slow, you, you decide, you know, what you really wanted to do, do a POC, and then go from there and then you figure it out you know what, what all applications that you wanted to migrate start with the small applications and then you know go from there because there is there is so, so much stuff right i mean you have to understand there is so much stuff in the cloud so much stuff that you have to do with the containerization uh, it is not just you know big bang approach that will decide that one fine day i'm going to go to cloud and then you know everything will be done so it, it has to be in the roadmap properly mapped on the stages and that's how uh, you should start moving in in your guys experience is that process of trying to get teams uh individuals working on these technologies up to speed is that is that one of the biggest hurdles that's what I, I'm seeing currently, uh, upskilling uh, the folks uh, to meet what company strategy is, and then you know, uh, making sure that you know goals are aligned, and then uh, uh, developers or you know, users uh, pick up those new technologies. Got it. Um, so we can, you know, and, uh, one important thing that um, Go ahead. Okay. one important thing that we have noticed with our uh, uh, customer experience is uh, with respect to uh, resource talent or skills, uh, particularly for uh, containerization, it's not pure development mindset. It is like an engineering mindset, an operations mindset, and a developer mindset combined together. So uh, just just upskilling with your developer mindset, like a Java programmer uh, developing a cloud application uh, for containerization, that may not be enough. Like you should also understand the infrastructure layer and above that the platform layer and above that the application layer. So you should have all three um, uh, knowledge and also you should know the life cycle of the DevOps, uh, the CACD pipeline integration, um, the vulnerability checks with respect to cloud security uh, for the image uh, vulnerability checks. So you should have all this knowledge stretched together to become a successful um, container uh, development uh, um, uh, work work workload uh, work management. Uh, otherwise, it will be really a disaster uh, at the end uh, when when we develop the containers. Yeah, but, but again, that is that is like sorry, sorry, but that is like too much expectation from one person to do all those things, right? So typically, you know, you see that 
you know developers focused on mainly on the development activities of course they have to have some understanding you know how their application is going to get deployed on what infrastructure they are going to get deployed but uh, my observation is that you know you have infrastructure teams still you cannot eliminate infrastructure team you have developers which will be mainly focusing on the development and then you have kind of you know combination of both teams where you know devops uh, comes into play where they kind of gel both the uh, developers and uh, infrastructure team together uh, kind of an sre role i would say uh, you know and then typically organizations will have you know these kind of uh, teams who actually execute uh, the strategy you hit on my point exactly Gonna my view you. is uh, at least yeah. at least in a team we should have a we should have a cloud consultant or a cloud architect who is capable of doing all this together so that he can guide the entire team it may be a developer resource or it may be other kind of resource but he can guide them from a holistic perspective so at least one person should be there like a cloud consultant or a cloud architect to handle all this engineering plus infrastructure and other that's my view yeah yeah so diving in from from there from kind of the macro level and diving into closer to implementation what are what advice do you guys have in terms of um, good and bad practices for using containers i know we talked about some of the use cases but like things that teams should be aware of and they should be doing to, to make sure what their their efforts are actually um, going to result in a net benefit for their application for for their teams for their organizations what are the things people the, the good and bad practices that people should be aware of I think the first rule is for team that all team should know how this uh, uh, Docker or any other containerization uh, framework uh, is uh, working. Uh, so have a, a background uh, and uh, uh, also if uh, the if the team has uh, the good uh, uh, DevOps department or, or some some team members also has the experience in the in the devops so they also should, uh, should take into account that uh, probably they should also spend time uh, on organizing some uh, pipelines and and so on so it, it also takes uh, time and should include an estimate uh, other than that i think uh, also uh, it depends on the project uh, requirements and the uh, customer understandings also. So, so if a customer involved in this process, uh, uh, he can understand that this tool can help. Other than that, then it's... Yeah. So... Like, can you do you mind uh, muting the? Thank you. Um, how about so, Dr. Magesh, AJ, uh, in terms of kind of you know best practices for using containers. What are the things that you guys have seen have, that people should be, you know, thinking about as they're implementing containers, how they're approaching it, um, things they should avoid doing? Yeah, so, um, hey, uh, that's a good question. Uh, as, you, as you start thinking about containers, you know, from the developer's perspective or you know whoever is going to work on the containerization it is very important to know that you know they have to first change the mindset right uh, the traditional applications 
or the application life cycle that typically we have worked on or i have i have also worked in the traditional um, uh, applications where you know you develop your application and then you have to go through you know multiple channels to deploy your application so application might just work on your machine uh, fine right and then as you start moving your application from development environment to test to uh, what are the staging environment qa production etc you see that you know the behavior changes and that behavior changes because you know infrastructure requires certain uh, setup before you deploy your application so you configure your infrastructure and then you deploy your application uh, with those pre configured setup right uh, uh, as you start working on the containers that mindset has to be left out you know it's that you know if you are setting up the application you have to think that your application is going to be a stand alone application it you know it is all contained within the image and that's how you should uh, set up your application it will have all the config required configurations for your application within that image when you deploy that image it is going to be an immutable if it works on your machine it is going to work on you know wherever you are going to deploy i mean i'm assuming the linux uh, operating system currently of course you know linux and windows little bit you cannot deploy a linux uh, container on windows and all but let's say you have a linux apply work application uh, which you are deploying on the linux currently and now you are moving that application to container you have to think that what all setup that you require on the infrastructure all that setup you have to do within your image because that image is going to get deployed along with the underlining os as well as the configurations right also other best practice is that you have to make sure that you know you don't package your monolith within your image and just try to deploy it right you know you have to follow certain best practices that you know your application should be small enough it just in single application that you should package the image should be small enough uh, you know you, you should not combine multiple application uh, within within that same image and try to uh give a behavior of you know traditional application and you expect that it will work as is similarly from the design perspective you should think that you know your application or the container can go down any time right so you should design uh, ha or high availability for your application when you think from the containerization perspective when you deploy this application you know you should be in a position to scale up and scale down your application and your application should be able to handle Uh, that kind of uh, load right if required then um, uh, this container platforms typically provides lot of facilities where you know you can have your liveliness check readiness checks etc you know it also has horizontal pod auto scaling etc like kubernetes platforms so when you when you think that you are, you are going to package your application in a container you have to think about all the benefits that you are going to get and you should you should design your application accordingly now along with the best practices there are certain uh, practices that you should not follow as well right for example right when you and it's all comes into you know kubernetes ecosystem typically that you, know, you you try to deploy your application you have an image you make sure that you know you don't use the image with the latest tag you know you will see that everywhere you know in most of the articles or so don't use latest tag when you try to deploy your image because that could change behavior of your of your application uh, if someone accidentally changes that particular image so you know these are these are few of the things you know we can talk more about what are the best practices uh, that uh, folks should follow but i would like to hear from uh, other members from the panel what they think and we can you know uh, build on it but i have you know lot of other examples and i can continue talking on that those oh, well so regarding the good practices and having deal with the uh, uh, monoliths for example we had a good example where it was the our saved our lives when we migrate our monolith and then in, in the past we are separated in the micro services and uh, in in the beginning migrating monolith in the containers and then using some uh, i would say containerization uh, system not kubernetes uh, so it, so it was more or less easy in the beginning but when we start uh, separating this big and huge 
container monolith into small one, then we experienced a lot of issues. Especially, so, yeah. So, and uh, there's also a bad example. Never ever you should, uh, or at least on the production, uh, use never put database inside containers, only use it as a SaaS. So, this is what my bad experience with me. So I have good example on the public market. I'm not ad ad advertising for this company, but this is how uh, this company moved from, it's a side core. I, I don't say this is the good and bad company. They also have some uh, good and bad uh, op options inside, but they now migrated to containers, the huge system. And they have like a Windows and, and, and Linux uh, containers inside one system. Of course, there are a lot of issues, but it, it, this is at least a good uh, sign that they kind of are thinking about this and, and, and moving forward. So, yes. Yeah, I have a couple of more points. One is with respect to enterprise integration for containers uh, which we need to take care of very much uh, when we are doing uh, container development uh, for example if we have to integrate with the uh, downstream systems or integrate with the uh, hybrid communication or um, any other uh, interface communications uh, make sure uh, like we have a proper design for the enterprise integration be it synchronous or asynchronous uh, without violating the security constraints of the containers so breaking the security constraints of containers and uh, enabling the enterprise uh, integration will not solve the purpose because it, the ultimate purpose of container is to um, isolate your application. So um, you have to bound by the security plus you have to enable the integration pattern as well. So that is one point. And uh, the second thing is uh, like um, Ajay mentioned, uh, keep your uh, application to be very simple, like lightweight. And at the same time, um, have you uh, like, uh, like do not uh, try out uh, um, heavyweight or uh, uh, huge application or multiple application together uh, so that it can it can uh, um, uh, bounce back on um, uh, testing or other activities as well. And uh, important point here is uh, when you are uh, managing uh, multiple versions of um, um, uh, container development, uh, like particularly we have faced uh, uh, with, uh, with customers where we, we used to develop uh, multiple versions in, in an agile uh, cycle, multiple versions of images and uh, used for uh, different environments, so maybe parallel development, parallel deployment. So, proper version control and uh, pipeline is also an important aspect of a successful container development uh, aspect. So when, so when people are adapting their CI/CD pipelines to containers, what are the things that they need to, to consider? So, um, uh, CI/CD pipeline is kind of critical uh, from the container perspective, just to maintain maintain the uh, you know entire DevSecOps workflow. Uh, the security plays a very big role. Uh, in the cloud as well as as you think from the containerization perspective uh, right and uh, recently and you know DevSecOps is picking up a lot uh, as well and you'll see you know, a lot of tools are coming into the market where uh, claiming that you know from the from the security perspective from the all the lift shape uh, 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 sorry shift lift uh, security you know starting from your workstation all the way up to your infrastructure right so the entire Kubernetes ecosystem, if you see, and the typical CI CD pipeline, you know, you have source code a system, a version control system, then you have um, a CI tool, uh, uh, and then you'll have multiple stages as part of your uh, continuous integration process. Uh, once that particular uh, stage is done with respect to the containerization, then you'll have um, image registry, 
right where you will be pushing your images and then the next piece is about deploying your application so either you know you can use your current ci system itself for the deployment or some organizations will have you know separate deployment tool for deploying the applications and then you have your infrastructure it could be uh, your containerized container platform running on the cloud or it could be on prem you know or hybrid model or how it is but if you think from the ecosystem uh, uh, ci cd ecosystem or the kubernetes ecosystem perspective all these pieces come into play and then you have to tie, tie them up together now you know typically for the for the containerization system you you check in the code your code will be built and then the output of your build process would be an image that goes into a container registry and then you have a set of your uh, deployment yaml files you could i mean you, you can use your plain yaml files or you could use helm or you know whatever the uh, tool that you wanted to use for deploying applications uh, to the infrastructure and then you know your app application gets deployed to the infrastructure and it will start running there now in this entire pipeline the security plays a major role uh, from my perspective and from the customer's perspective as well where you have to think that when user starts to write their code and they starts you know uh, uh, getting the packages or dependencies for their applications from the external repositories are those uh, uh, dependencies or the packages are secured you have to implement the security at that particular stage as you come to the ci pipeline you have to make sure that you have you are uh, enabling scanning of those um, docker images as you build those images as you publish those image in, image, images into um, registry you have to make sure that your registry is getting scanned uh, with with whatever the security tool that you you are using once your images are ready as you deploy your application now the security of the container platform comes into picture where you have to make sure that you use the the security that platform is providing like in case of the kubernetes you know you, you use proper uh, rbac model you use proper um, psps security context that kubernetes platform provides but apart from that the host itself right i mean all the worker nodes or the controller nodes are those really secured are the running containers are are secured you know so all those have to be taken into consideration into this kubernetes ecosystem or you know in your ci cd pipeline uh, yeah yeah i agree with you so security here is also the uh, incredibly important topic because a lot of containers based uh, can be based uh, on on several images on top so it's like a pipe and if one uh, image uh, of your one of your root images has some viruses inside then all, all of your images can be uh, exploited so this is important topic so you should also provide some checks uh, so also is that important to keep uh, your eye into the networking because you can also uh, Forget about some holes and open, open and uh, not close some ports inside your container. So you you should never ever rely on the default rules of the, for example, a Docker networker on, and uh, keep keep eye on the uh, network bridges and so on. So that's also important stuff here. So I agree with you as well. Have you guys seen any any um, any like what are the most common attack vectors you see? I mean, you mentioned open ports, the shared kernel. What are the things that that people really have to to be aware of? And are there new are there kind of emerging attack vectors that people need to be thinking about with containers? They should uh, check uh, images uh, always because there are a lot of uh, previously it was a lot of attacks through the fake images. So, uh, for example, the most popular image, uh, one of the most popular images, is nginx, and some people and some hackers they just uh, create a fake image with a virus or some additional uh, program that can get your password and keys from your uh, containers 
and uh, yeah, and then it's it, it's better to have some tools and uh, software that can be that can check for you. Yeah, I, I read about you know uh, a few incidents where uh, some users I don't remember what what images those were, but uh, users were trying to pull uh, user tried to pull an image from Docker Hub and uh, accidentally he misspelled the image and the wrong image got pulled in and you know that that is kind of you know virus uh, spread yeah. across i don't remember exact that incident but i just remember that it was a typo in the image name which caused that problem and there was an image with a similar name uh, with you know malicious content yeah. right there and similarly the recently also i heard about and this is not about the images but it is about um uh, package managers where you know dependency confusion that's what you call so you pull down the dependencies for your applications and you accidentally uh, uh, use a different version or you you know you have a typo in there and malicious dependency gets pulled in uh, in your environment so yeah security is very critical currently yeah. with yeah. you know all the open source components that are being used uh, it is good and uh, it we have to be very cautious with that as we migrate to cloud or you know containerization efforts security has to be there do you feel like security practices are keeping up with the move towards containerization because typically security in an organization is standalone and maybe they have kind of embedded processes that they've been following for a long time and policies like is there a dichotomy between how quickly development is moving and how quickly security is moving so so that is very true and i'm seeing that now that boundary is kind of going away that security is kind of playing or you know coming together with the developers as well as with the infrastructure team because now you cannot think that you know security is altogether separate it has to be as i mentioned earlier that it has to be uh, implemented at every stage and uh, my observation is that you know that is happening uh, although you know it is little bit lagging but uh, it is it is happening that security team is coming together and uh, you know providing the guidance around all those things how do we secure our environment oh well sometimes it's uh, yeah as you know there's a lot of st startups and then there are not so many people then or like a five or four and they're doing everything and uh, this is kind of like a time to a market issue so they you should roll out your project and see the first results and of course nobody's uh, thinking about security and then yeah but anyway yeah, yeah, it, it depends on yeah it depends on your organization like you know how big you are uh, i agree yeah. i mean it's it, it, it depends really uh, I, i'm talking about the big organizations where i have um, experience currently with mm -hmm. you know where security is kind of a big role yeah yeah it's, for the enterprise it's true so it should yeah. be like a whole a, a department yeah, for correct correct yeah yeah actually a yeah, best practice uh, like from uh, when you are uh, when you are uh, uh, having a uh, yeah, uh, setup like a cloud coe uh, the best practice would be combining four entities together one is uh, the application development team second is the cloud security team that is the cloud assurance team and fourth is the infrastructure team all four entities should be part of one single uh, part or it can be one single unit of uh, um, uh, development uh, team who can hand in hand work together for security uh, for assurance so for uh, the infrastructure capability and uh, performance uh, resilience handling and the application uh, related aspects all four together so that would be the best practice uh, from a coe perspective So can I ask you guys, we were approaching uh, maybe 15 minutes remaining. I wanted to, one question I did want to ask each of you is, um, 
Are there any specific technologies or uh, that, that excite you currently in this space? Can you talk about, are you talking about any specific like languages or you're talking about specific tools? Specific tools like around, um, around you know, any part of, of con your containerized application, whether it's uh, yeah, managing the security, managing the container registry, manage, like are there specific tools, like what is the general, uh, I mean, the space has changed a lot in the past two to three years, right? I mean, we talked a little bit, I think one of the topics somebody suggested was like, what are some of the alternatives to Docker? Are there some exciting Docker alternatives out there? Um, what about on, uh, you know, in container orchestration and what, you know, Kubernetes is the, the kind of elephant in the room, but are there things that you guys, that you see coming up that you think are exciting and offer alternatives? Yeah, so for example, for uh, a security, there are some uh, uh, software, uh, for example, which is integrated in, into cloud, where you can use like a uh, firewall, uh, and which will sc uh, scan your uh, images, which you download, uh, and will find uh, find some uh, vulnerability there, also. But in terms of um, uh, Docker competitors, uh, there are not so many of them. I found uh, uh, like one of them is uh, the Podman. So if you know, and another one is a rocket. And of course, it, it, it's there's some like a Mesos, somebody knows. But I, uh, I haven't seen that someone is uh, using it like for like Docker. So maybe you guys have experience with them more than me. So I, I just tried one Podman, and it seems like a, maybe. Uh, Docker is the one of the in the market which is kind of like an elite. So. Yeah. So, so uh, my experience, like because I started working with Docker, you know, I started my container journey with Docker itself. Uh, <laughs> the customer there, where I was working with uh, uh, for Docker, you know. Docker requires mainly root privileges to run your daemon. You know, that is a big no uh, in the big enterprises. Uh, uh, essentially, again, we didn't want developers to give the Docker because uh, on the on the laptop, you have to spin up a VM or Hyper-V uh, in order to run the Docker. You know, that is kind of a security risk. So as an alternative, uh, so Boris, you mentioned about the Podman. Yeah, we, we started using uh, Podman, which is again an, another open source tool, which is an alternative to Docker uh, uh, from Red Hat mainly. And Red Hat is a major contributor uh, in that. Uh, along with Podman, there is a tool called Builda, which Podman uses internally. Uh, there are other, there are actually mainly three three tools, like you know, Podman, there's a Scopio, and there is a Builda. So these are the three tools uh, that are currently available as an alternative to Docker. There is also a Kaniko uh, that you know if you really wanted to do um, builds in the rootless mode, uh, if you want to build images uh, without using Docker, you know you can use Kaniko uh, for that purpose. There is something called IMG. There is something called Orca uh, is also available. So there are there are few alternatives available. I I, I found that Podman is currently probably the more close to all the stuff that Docker is doing. Actually, it does everything that uh, uh, Docker does uh, based on my experience. Uh, and that is a good alternative. As far as the um, Kubernetes uh, platforms itself, uh, there are various uh, options available in the market. Uh, uh, we are using currently OpenShift. Uh, which provides a lot of capabilities on top of the plain on top of plain uh, Kubernetes. You know, it gives you enterprise grade uh, uh, management platform uh, integrated with uh, operator framework. Uh, 
uh, access control, uh, logging, monitoring, alerting, uh, networking, you know, all, all the basically all uh, required enterprise uh, pieces are there. Now, granted that you know it, it may not meet may not meet all your organization requirements, and you have to develop few things around it. But most of the basic stuff uh, is already integrated in the OpenShift. Then there are other platforms that are coming up like uh, VMware uh, Tanzu, uh, which also provides uh, similar capabilities. Although, although I don't have a lot of experience with that, I was just reading through it. Um, uh, and then Pivotal had Pivotal Container Services. I, I don't know if that is there anymore or you know, how it is being developed. But uh, and then this um, Mirantis now recently acquired uh, Docker, right? So they have uh, Mirantis Container Services. Uh, and then uh, from the Docker Swarm perspective, there is a Docker Enterprise Edition uh, that is available as an alternative as well again i don't have experience i'm just you know throwing out these tools which i have come across yeah and uh, by yeah. the way that the tools, uh, kubernetes can can work or uh, not only with a with a docker and uh, it can work with also with some uh, i think five and six uh, uh, containerization engines so it's, you don't have to even uh, use the Docker, so you can use some. Yeah, so yeah, the Cryo, Cryo, I think Cryo is picking up recently, right? It's an yeah. OCI standard, so Cryo is picking up, and Kubernetes also supports Cryo now. Uh, yeah. OpenShift also removed the support. Earlier, OpenShift was using Docker runtime, and now uh, Docker support has been removed, or the Docker runtime has been removed from the OpenShift, and now they are supporting, you know, Cryo mainly. So that's you know that's that's what is happening currently. Uh, two more tools that I want to mention here. One is uh, Rancher and me, Apache Mesos. Uh, actually, those two tools uh, which excited me a lot. Uh, but um, um, I also faced uh, um, uh, issues uh, when when practically working in Rancher and Mesos as compared to Docker or uh, Kubernetes platform uh, services, uh, particularly with respect to agility or with respect to um, uh, agnostic solution development, right? Uh, and uh, like configuration, like uh, configuration related aspects or integrated security aspects. So they are a bit lagging, uh, Rancher and uh, um, Apache Mesos, a bit lagging as compared to the other uh, standard tools. And, from my customer experience point of view, what I have seen is customer has uh, uh, two major uh, vision with respect to tool. One is they don't want to experiment with uh, open source tools in practical runtime uh, production environments or uh, taking it to production environment. Uh, so they, they want to use something more standard, more native, for example, directly use EKS or EKS or GKE don't go for any uh, third party open source or any other tools uh, because we don't know what kind of security issues would be there, what kind of support facilities would be there. So that is one major concern that customer used to have, uh, the first problem. Second problem is um, with respect to native integration of monitoring, observability and all these services, uh, they will be very cautious to see if, uh, if we have to additionally invest effort and uh, um, cost to, to do this for any other uh, uh, external tools uh, for, for all these activities uh, instead of going with the native services. So these are all the major concerns that I have seen with, with my customers and from that perspective I, I prefer to have uh, in a safe site to use Docker as a standard with any Kubernetes engine from native solutions instead of going for uh, open source tool or any other uh, stuff here. Yeah, run, running a uh, open source tool which doesn't have support basically would be a big risk in the production environment. Right. So we have, um, you know, just over five minutes and uh, we should be respectful of all your time. Um, but if it, you know, I want to open it up. There are there are a few people in here listening now. I want to give them a chance to ask you guys questions. Um, 
And so we'll take some questions uh, uh, and they can, you guys can drop questions in the chat or if you wanna put on your microphone and ask a question, um, the panel here is, is, will answer to the best of their abilities. I've, I've got a question. Uh, this is Ed. Um, I'm curious about uh, one of the reasons I chose Kubernetes, and I, I haven't actually deployed an application to production. So I'm curious as the people who deployed applications to production with the specific goal of remaining cloud agnostic. Um, like, like, how do you go about doing that? And one of the things I ran into, for example, we deployed to Azure for our test application and we wrote some Terraform stuff and I made a lot of effort to keep the Terraform as small as possible provisioning a, a, uh, an AKS cluster. But then very quickly, you find yourself getting addicted to uh, Active Directory for authentication so that you don't have to bring in something like uh, Okta or Keycloak. Um, you start using their logging, you start using their monitoring. Um, are, are there best practices as to remaining cloud agnostic? And is that even a goal worth pursuing? Uh, well, uh, regarding my experience using some cloud agnostic stuff, it's it's incredibly <clears throat> hard to achieve, especially when you're using the three or more cloud providers. So it's always better to uh, have like a separate scripts for a different cloud. And in, in many cases, uh, using Terraform, it's not, not always a good option. Terraform is, is a good uh, uh, infrastructure as a code framework, but sometimes maybe you know also you can uh, destroy everything with them just with a simple run and maybe it's a, a at least from my experience and i'm using a, a separate pipelines and scripts with a, explicitly for each cloud each, each cloud yeah my experience is the same as well right you know we talk about cloud agnostic but um, as you start looking into multi cloud strategy you know it is it is difficult to achieve that particular goal you have different different services and there are different requirements to use those services and you, know, you just cannot use the same thing to integrate with multiple cloud providers Uh, I have posted uh, a, a blog in uh, LinkedIn on um, best practices for cloud agnostic solution and how we can uh, implement that. I will paste that link in this chat room. You can see if it is helpful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ed, for your question. Good question. Um, Thanks, Ed, for your question. We have a couple other questions in the chat. I'd love to throw them out to you guys. Uh, the first question I have is, how would you compare the future of containers versus serverless? So uh, they, they will go by this a separate way. Some companies uh, incredibly like use uh, a serverless. Uh, if you're talking about like a, a Azure function or a, a AWS Lambda, and some companies just uh, go with, with uh, Docker containers plus uh, Kubernetes or maybe other uh, system. But what I see now is trend to use uh, containers more than a serverless. However, there is another option, use a serverless plus uh, Kubernetes. So now, now you can even go with this. The only complexity with all this stuff is always a DevOps. So uh, if you have one, two or 100 uh, serverless services, or points or units or micro services, let's use this buzzword, then it's the uh, nightmare to uh, deploy and, and support and all this stuff. So it's always you should ask yourself 
what is the simplest solution for you here in your uh, in your requirements always yeah for for kubernetes now there is something called k native which is picking up now right and yeah. uh, the use cases are different uh, you know you, you can you can think from that perspective it's not that you know the service serverless is going to be replacing it based on the use cases how you wanted to uh, dip, uh, how, how how your application is getting used right can your application uh, be shut down when it is not in use uh, you know th then it's okay to use serverless but if your application has to be available 24 by 7 then uh, you know you cannot really use serverless in that case. Uh, there are scenarios where specific events for, for specific event-based system, you can use serverless uh, so that you know when the event, event happens, a particular uh, application or particular pod will come up and will process your request and then it will die down, right? Similarly, uh, there, there could be a use case where, you know, there are a lot of requests coming in and now you wanted to scale up your application, in which case, you know, you can use serverless a lot of events are coming up you spin up or scale up your application and then as soon as the requests die down use uh, you uh, scale down your pods and serverless is going to take care of it so i would say i mean both both approaches are going hand, hand in hand it's the based on the use cases you decide you know which which one you wanted to use which one is more cost effective Uh, one more point, um, Rancher has uh, introduced something called as uh, lightweight uh, Kubernetes called as K3S, which is very effective and it is even uh, production ready, like we can use it for production deployment, for, uh, for production ready containerization as well. So that is good one to try uh, speaking up in the market now. <coughs> Okay, we've got another question um, from Tria. It is, what should be, and you guys may have touched on this a little bit in the beginning of our conversation, but what should be the initial steps when moving to containerization and what should be the thought process and approach? So um, I would say, you know, do your homework before you start into that journey. Uh, my experience is, uh, we started with the POC, you know, we understood, you know, what are the pieces that are required uh, in order to enable uh, containerization in the organization. And that's how we started. You pick up a simple uh, use case that is very easy to, you know, learn most of the pieces that are required uh, in the container ecosystem. Uh, try end-to-end, -end, you know, workflow. Not, don't, don't, don't just do, you know, one piece and then uh, proceed further, you know, do end-to-end -end deployment kind of scenario, start you know, from the development all up to, you know, CI/CD pipeline, and then uh, image registries, etc. and deploy your application uh, so that you get an end-to-end -end or the big picture or, or all the pieces that are required. Because eventually you have to start adding, you know, a lot of guidelines, a lot of principles on top of that. You have to come up with, you know, what tools you are going to use. So if you have a basic understanding, that will help you out. So start small, uh, pick up simple application, and then you know uh, do a POC, and then build on top of that uh, on that knowledge. Yeah, I can only agree with this. Uh, can only add. Uh, also, have a look on how you can debug and test your application in the end. Just the simple end-to-end -end test and how you can uh, debug it. Containerization the application. Dr. Magesh, would you like to add anything there? Um, I think um, uh, Ajay has rightly mentioned that, like, start with like small aspect like like a yeah, uh, simple application or a simple uh, um, um, uh, architecture to develop in containerization like instead of going with a yeah, heavyweight big bang approach for containerization that is very important 
uh, and uh, it, it actually gives the facility for you to fail fast like you can fail first and then you can recover very fast otherwise when you fail at the later stage you will have a miserably a uh, lot of uh, effort to be spent to recover from there but if you fail fast at the early stages you can easily recover with less effort so that you can quickly build on uh, uh, with the best practices that you have learned for so far so that is very important when when you start uh, that is very important for the initial steps for your containerization Great, thanks. Um, okay, so I don't see any more questions for Great, now. Um, we're already over time. So I am going to suggest that we move towards wrapping up. Uh, everybody who is in attendance, um, you can connect with each panelist here. I think Blake dropped their LinkedIn um, into the into the chat. Um, and uh, we will certainly uh, take this recording and put it up so people can, can go back and revisit it. Uh, I wanna thank all three of you uh, for being here and sharing your experience. I know we had a lot to cover in a short amount of time and it's a big space. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'd love for us to be able to carry this conversation on and maybe go deeper into some areas in the future. Um, but this was a great, uh, you know, a great hour. I really appreciate all the insight you guys brought. Um, and uh, yeah, just appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you so much, Thank you. Oh, and I have one more, I guess I have one more thing to say, which is uh, we are going to be publishing a trend report, a containers trend report on DZone in May, May? no, June. Um, and right now, uh, we're going to probably use this panel to help us figure out what are the things we mm -hmm. should talk about in that report. But um, we're also seeking people to write in that report. So for the panelists, for anyone who's attending that, you know, has a experience in containers, if you're interested in, in sharing your thoughts and being a part of that publication, you can email uh, our publications team at publications at dzone.com mm -hmm. or uh, reach out through Slack or email and publishes in May. Thank you, Anita. Um, and yeah, so we're still looking for authors. So if any of you want to write for that, we, we invite you to, uh, to, to reach out. I'm and, in. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Well, then, uh, I will, I'll be in touch with you specifically. Um, yeah. thank you so again, thank you guys so much. Uh, hopefully we'll get to do this again sometime soon. Really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank, thank you guys. Me. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks Blake. Bye. Thanks for organizing Blake. Thanks, Blake.